Hello, Dickens Universe friends. I am Tiger Wright. I live in Santa Cruz, California. I want to show you today some passages from Chapter 11, Volume 1 of Waverly, or To Sixty Years Since by Sir Walter Scott, who is a predecessor, as you know, of Dickens. The person I really want to call your attention to is a minor character. We will meet her after some backstory and some introduction and uh, some passages. So I have humbly felt obliged to edit the story a bit. I hope you will allow that. I thought it would be for the best. I think the sense of it comes through. So here we go with our backstory. It starts with Edward Waverley, the central character. He's a young English gentleman at the age of realizing he must uh, choose a profession. And being a dilettante and clueless sort of young man, he has a hard time until he is given a commission in the English army. So that settles that. And he, on the way to a posting in Scotland, visits some Scottish friends of the family. This will lead to some possibilities for um, compromising situations because he will find himself circulating among Scottish loyalists who oppose the government that Edward serves. So um, one evening, his very careless host, Baron Bradwardine, wines and dines him and has a huge fine party for him, a feast and with plenty of wine. And to this he invites his cohort. That includes the Lairds, Bamuapple, and Killingcurrit, the two loyal subjects of Bunny Prince Charlie, actually. The uh, drinking in the evening is enhanced by the production of a special ceremonial drinking cup called the Blessed Bear of Bradwardine. And that is filled with uh, plenty of claret, everyone quaffs away, and Edward feels he must too, to honor the uh, situation. Plenty of drinking continues until Edward and the Baron, Killingcurrit and Bamuapple adjourn to a nearby inn. And there they will meet the Scottish woman that I would like to uh, call attention to, that's Lucky McCleary who is the proprietress of the inn. Okay, when they arrived at Lucky McCleary's, the lairds of Bamuapple and Killingcurrit declared their determination to acknowledge their sense of the hospitality with a deoch andoris, which is a drink by the door, what we might call a stirrup cup, to the honor of the Baron's roof tree. And the roof tree is part of a superstition that places a living tree on the roof of a building to appease the spirits of the lumber, the wood used in the construction of the building. So I thought that was a lovely idea. So they entered the inn, leading Edward in unresisting submission, for his landlord whispered him that to demur to such an overture would be construed into a high misdemeanor against the leige convivial or regulations of genial computation. Widow McLeary seemed to have expected this visit as well she might, for it was the usual com consummation of merry bouts at most gentlemen's houses in Scotland sixty years since. The guests then spent what Falstaff calls the sweet of the night in the genial license of a tavern. Accordingly, in full expectation of these distinguished guests, Lucky McLeary had swept her house for the first time this fortnight, tempered her turf fire to such a heat as the season required in her damp hovel, even at midsummer, set forth her de deal table newly washed, propped its lame foot with a fragment of turf, arranged four or five stools of huge and clumsy form upon the sites which best suited the inequalities of her clay floor. And having moreover put on her clean toy, roquelet and scarlet plaid, gravely awaited the arrival of the company in full hope 
of custom and profit. When they were seated under the sooty rafters of Lucky McCleary's only apartment, thickly tapestried with cobwebs, their hostess appeared with a huge pewter measuring pot containing at least three English quarts, familiarly de denominated a tappet hen, in which in the language of the hostess, or rather reamed, reamed with excellent claret just drawn from the cask. It was soon plain that what crumbs of reason the bear had not devoured were to be picked up by the hen. There follows um, lots of drinking and a din of bellowing ballads, bragging and talking nonsense, woven into rising emotions, contempt, and withering restraint. Here's some more text. Bamuapo pronounced the claret shilpit, meaning weak or insipid, and demanded brandy with great vociferation. It was brought, and now the demon of politics inspired the laird of Bamuapo, and he demanded a bumper with the lungs of a stentor. He proposed a politically incendiary toast. Edward was not at that moment clear-headed, yet felt inclined to take umbrage at a toast which seemed, from the glance of Bamuapo's eye, to have a peculiar and uncivil reference to the government which he served. But ere he could interfere, the Baron of Bradwardine had taken up the quarrel. There ensues a fugue of arguments. Bradwardine and Edward disagreeing on who should address Bamuapple's affront, and Bradwardine versus Bamuapple with vehemence for the sin of insulting a guest. Bradwardine says, And for you, Mr. Falconer of Bamuapple, I warn ye, let me see no more aberrations from the paths of good manners. And I tell you, Mr. Cosmo Comine, Bradwardine of Bradwardine and Tully Violin, retorted the sportsman in huge disdain, that I will make a moorcock of the man that refuses my toast, whether it be a crop-eared English wig or ain who deserts his ain friends to claw favor with the rats of Hanover. In an instant, both rapiers were brandished and some desperate passes exchanged. Bamawapu was young, stout, and active, but the baron infinitely more master of his weapon. Edward rushed forward to interfere between the combatants, but the prostrate bulk of the Laird of Kilincurrit, over which he stumbled, intercepted his passage. Be, be that as it may, if readier aid than either his or Waverley's had not interposed, there would certainly have been bloodshed. But the well-known clash of swords, which was no stranger to her dwelling, aroused Lucky McCleary as she sat quietly beyond the hallan or earthen partition of the cottage. Engaged, summing up the reckoning, she boldly rushed in with a shrill expostulation, while their honors slay ain another there and bring discredit on an honest wi widow woman's house when there was ah the lee land in the country to fight upon, a remonstrance which she see seconded by flinging her plate with great dexterity over the weapons of the combatants. The servants by this time rushed in and, being by great chance tolerably sober, separated the incensed opponents with the assistance of Edward and Killencourt. The latter led off Bamo Apple, cursing, swearing, and vowing revenge against every Whig, Presbyterian, and fanatic in England and Scotland. And with difficulty, they got him to his horse. Our hero, with the assistance of a retainer, escorted the Baron of Bradwardine to his own dwelling, but could not prevail upon him to retire to bed until he had made a long and learned apology for the events of the evening, of which, however, there was not a word intelligible, except something about the centaurs and the lapithai. And you could look up this famous mythological battle if you like. So I hope you have enjoyed my little video spree. Maybe it will inspire you to read Waverly if you haven't done so already can be very funny in places and very colorful and very sad. However, and very nostalgic, maybe we were, when we were younger, something like Edward Waverley to a certain extent. So let us take a visual, a virtual stirrup cup or a Deo Honduras 
until we meet again. Thank you, Dickens Universe. I hope to see, actually, really see you in the near future. Custom that has stood the test of time. It's a custom that's been carried out in every land and clime where brother Scots forget.